All right, so welcome everybody. Thanks for having us today. Um, I'm Stephanie Montgomery, Senior Vice President of Research and Best Practices at the XR Association. And with me today is someone who's been mentioned in every presentation so far. This is Ann Lord Bailey, Executive Director um, at the VA Immersive. And so we're happy to have you here and have Thanks. a conversation. Thanks for having me. Two great talks before this, so it's an honor to be here. All right, absolutely. Um, I wanted to start off with uh, just a few questions for the audience. How many in the audience right now are developers developing something? And how many of you are developing for healthcare? Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, it's great to see that, right? Um, just a little bit about XR, the association, and who we are and what we do. So we're the trade association representing the entire ecosystem here in the immersive technology space. Uh, we do advocacy work on the Hill, and we work with the Reality Caucus there to help drive uh, budgeting and funding and grants, et cetera, through the federal government, as well as developing best practices guides in areas broader than we do it in healthcare, we do it in education, we do accessibility guides um, and general guides for, for um, developers who are starting to work in the market. And then we also do a little bit of uh, work on research and publish infographics in this space too. And I've been pleased to be able to work with uh, the VA and um, share some of their use cases and stories and, and broaden the message out. Absolutely, thank you so much for your advocacy. I think we should all give a round of applause for XRA and the work that they're doing for sure. Thanks, thanks. Well, uh, so raise your hand if you're familiar with the VA. Uh, and look at that. We used to come to these things and nobody knew who the VA was. So um, it's exciting to see that. So 9 million veterans, over 170 medical centers, more than 1,200 sites of care across the United States, the largest integrated healthcare system in the country. Um, we have the honor and the privilege and the mission of serving our veterans, um, also 400,000 staff. So a lot of opportunity. Also just want to speak to uh, Bob and Laura. Thank you so much for that phenomenal history. I, I was so excited about that and also continue to be reminded uh, that we stand on the shoulders of giants. I mean, Walter is here, Skip is in the room, in the building somewhere, I don't know if Skip's in the room, uh, but so many legends in this space that have really been dedicated for, uh, for so many years so that we could come to this critical point in time and move into Bob's third wave. Uh, and so many things in the last talk I, wanna, I would love to address about why VA is so important in this space, but I'll be quiet and let you ask the questions. <laughs> I feel like I don't have to ask many questions, Anne. Uh, 25 is going to be easy to fill. I know, right? All right. <laughs> but let's start with why is the VA in this space? What inspired you and Caitlin Rollins to like start down this path, right? Yeah, that's a great question. So I am a pharmacy practitioner by training. For those of you who aren't familiar with um, pharmacy and VA, I actually completed a residency. Um, so I'm a mid-level provider. Um, and what also became an innovation specialist, which is basically someone who's uh, designed to be at one of the medical centers to build the innovation muscle and the culture of frontline staff. Competencies in human-centered design and those kinds of things, pro solving, solving problems from the end user perspective, right? Super cool job. Uh, well, one day I was practicing in, uh, in the VA in Asheville and a bedside nurse came down to me and said, I need to tell you about something that I think there's some opportunity for. I was Caitlin Rollins. Um, she was new to the VA. She actually has an art background. I have a music background, so you can see why immersive technology makes sense to us, right? Like science and art put together. Um, and what she was starting to see, an orthopedic surgeon had come to her and said, have you ever thought about virtual reality uh, for post-operative knee pain and anxiety? And she took the opportunity to start investigating that. She actually reached out across VA to see if anybody was using virtual reality in that, in that space. This is 2017. Um, at the time, Everyone who responded was like, seems like a cool idea, but nobody's doing it. Uh, we have since learned that people in VA were actually doing it prior to that, so it shows you there's also a need for us to continue to find ways to share what we know, what we're learning, even within our own system, but certainly beyond that. Um, and so Caitlin started piloting this inpatient unit post-operative knee pain and anxiety. And one of the first veterans was a World War II veteran. And he had never even heard the term virtual reality, but he trusted his healthcare team who were like, you should try this thing. Um, and he said that was the first time he hadn't felt pain in 10 years. And we hear those stories every single day, not just around pain, but around mental health, physical rehabilitation, loneliness, isolation, you name it. Some of the most difficult to address clinical indications uh, where either medications are risky or they don't necessarily work or they don't work long term. We're seeing incredible benefit in those spaces uh, with this technology. Okay, I'm going to dive in with off script. So 
With that, we tell a lot of stories about this, but how do we make those into repeatable experiences that are constantly deployed? You talked some about building that community and how the community works together. So how do we kind of get beyond just the, the stories into you know, repeatable experiences? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Bob showed a slide of some of our early innovation pilots, and that's really where we are in VA right now, is moving from where we are seven years into piloting this. And if you're here from a healthcare system and are just getting into the space or are less than seven years into it, we are happy to tell you everything we've learned so that you don't have to repeat the same things that we've had to figure out, right? Uh, we will share our operating procedures, our documentation templates, whatever you need. We're happy to share those things. Uh, but that's really been one of the biggest pieces is collaboration and community. Um, building that expertise, not in a central place, but really decentralizing it. Not having it uh, circle around particular personalities or individuals because that becomes a bottleneck for what needs to happen. What we want to do is equip our staff and our veterans with how do you use this technology, where do you use this technology, and when do you use this technology. Um, so where we are right now that I think will help us really move from that, what uh, our chief innovation officer that some of you guys know, Mark Zhang, calls a brute force effort uh, to something that's actually just woven into how we deliver healthcare is really building that infrastructure around it. Um, and I think we have some really critical opportunities for that, and we would love for you all to be more involved, actually. And maybe that leads right into the made by, made for VA initiative, right? right? That you're talking about how to like drive that when developers are coming into the VA, how That's they do right. that, right? That's absolutely right. So uh, for those of you who are involved in the International Virtual Reality and Healthcare Association, IVRA, uh, there was the, the annual global symposium in Florida in March. And Dr. Susan Kirsch, who's actually here with us today, a senior executive in VA, stood up, which is really important when you have this type of executive leadership, stand up and say, VA is dedicated to this, and the next step we're going to do is launch this initiative called Made for VA. Uh, basically an HOV lane, if you will. We're working really hard with Laura and others um, on our team, uh, as well as Bob, Walter, so many people that are in this room. We're really trying to put together a lot of deep expertise and diverse expertise, uh, people that have um, experience in um, accessibility and equity and inclusion and those kinds of things, also technical requirements, so that what we can do is set out a design guide, both for technical requirements and software or experience requirements, so that over time we can build a, a guidance so that you can say if these are things are true about what you're developing or designing, then you can work more quickly within VA. Um, and we hope that as we start to put those guidelines out, we would love to get your feedback on those. Uh, we are certainly one critical piece of the puzzle, but just one piece of the puzzle. So we need to know from your perspective as well. You'll start to see us make that more public um, over the next several months. And I think we can't like overstate the uniqueness of the VA and the affordances of making all these processes free and available and open so that all of you can use them and access them if you desire to do so. Um, and also the unique affordances of being able to be a little more risky maybe in some of the prototyping that you do, right? I mean, it's an yeah. opportunity. I think that's really important. There was a question asked about reimbursement in the last talk. That's another way that VA is really unique. We are both payer and provider. Um, your taxpayer dollars are what are paying for the health care for our veterans. And so we need to be good stewards of that money. It gives us the opportunity to look primarily at, um, at, at lowering costs, preventive health care, value-based care, those kinds of approaches. And this technology is uniquely suited for that type of environment. Also gives us the opportunity as a government agency to work more closely with FDA and CMS and NIH and some of those other government agencies, government to government supporting the broader community. Um, and I think if we can ask some of those questions that the regulators or reimbursement entities need to know as we are piloting these things and taking on that early risk, maybe that will uh, more easily set the stage for everyone else to join as well. Yeah, absolutely. I know we've been uh, talking most recently with the FDA and talking to them about their process. A couple of the immersive technologies, Mind VR is here, right, have, have gone through that process and getting certified by the FDA, but they have a lot of questions uh, of how to do it, how to handle issues like operating system upgrades and what allowed, how does that impact the technology deployment from the healthcare side. So we have been talking to them a lot about what's going on there and are, and are going to put out a paper recently about that. So um, it's good to hear that you're connected into those communities because it does 
filter through. Right? Yeah, I think the heads and headsets piece has been really critical. Bob referenced that. Uh, that actually came from Dr. Kerr. She did a demo uh, in a headset one day and took the headset off and was like, it's kind of like butts and seats, except it's heads and headsets. <laughs> And we're like, that's it, that's the thing. And we know that, um, I think Walter says this a lot, the, the headset itself is the syringe, right? It's not the thing that is actually de delivering the effect, it's the experience in the headset. So that's a really important piece of the puzzle. Maybe we'll come up with a new hashtag around the experience. Um, but I do think that piece of the puzzle, any of you who are working on buy-in and engagement, that experience is really what makes a huge difference, is getting those heads and headsets, because very quickly, we have seen people who are cynics or who are skeptics actually become some of our greatest evangelists. And it has to be a great experience the first time. Exactly, it's yeah. how you facilitate that experience. It certainly makes a difference. <laughs> it really does make a big difference. Um, can you talk a little bit about like, the research you're able to do? We haven't mentioned that really yet today. Yeah, sure, so within, um, actually under, so again, VA is a really complicated place, right? So there is a, uh, the Discovery Education and Affiliate Networks group. That's a group that uh, Dr. Kirsch and Dr. Carolyn Clancy lead. Um, under that group, there's research and development, innovation, academic affiliations, and healthcare advancement and partnerships. If you think about those four entities, you have a really powerful group of people. You've got research, you've got innovation, you have health professions training, 70% of healthcare professionals train at some point in a VA, which is another reason to work with VA, right? Because then they go through medical school. Um, I think that was something Bob referenced as well. They go through medical school having experienced learning in the technology and or delivering care with the technology and then thinking about community partnerships. But VA is, it has a, a significant impact in the research community. So things that you think about are normal in healthcare systems, uh, whether it be telehealth, electronic health records, nicotine patches, BCMA barcoding, um, those types of things actually started in VA. So we are thinking about immersive technology in the same way that years from now, you'll look back and think, well, this is just how we do business. We deliver care and we train our staff using this technology. Right, and you're able to then, because of your community base, you're able to do like user research as it comes forward, right? And yeah. kind of ask them questions coming out of the experience, which helps build the body of knowledge to support future deployments. That's exactly on the right. Efficacy. That's yeah. really been a critical piece of all of this, honestly, um, because we know tech companies and designers are phenomenal at developing and designing and deploying products. But if you haven't done that in concert with the healthcare system, with the end user, what sometimes happens is you come up with this really great thing. I believe you, it works but does it work in our clinical workflow? Will our clinicians actually pick it up and use it? Will our veterans put it on their head and respond to it? If you haven't incorporated the end user into that ent entire design process, uh, what you end up with is a really cool thing that we can't ultimately utilize. Um, one of the ways that we've seen that is some of the development we've done with uh, companies, and, and we've done development with many people in this room. Uh, um, Chris mentioned with what we're doing with Mind Immersive. I have to say here, we don't endorse any particular company or product, but we do work with a lot of people. So I think Trip was here, we were talking to them, Helium, a lot of the applied VR, we've worked with a lot of those people and groups. We've also done some of our own content development. And throughout that process, then taking it into the medical centers, had our staff and veterans try it, taken feedback, and then iterated on the content. Uh, we've seen a lot of powerful use there, particularly in our prevention of sexual harassment training, uh, because we wanna better understand that lived experience and also how could we learn um, from that and use that immersive environment to train people. Yeah, I tried that experience actually. It was kind of interesting. I had not thought about being you know, heckled as I was going to get my prescription from the pharmacy. Yep. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. And, and that's one that came from a women's program manager at the VA in Atlanta is over 27,000 women veterans at that single medical center and said many of her veterans have said they've experienced or they're afraid that they might experience um, harassment in an environment, um, in a healthcare environment. So how do we change that? Well, one of the ways is we help people who don't have that lived experience understand it the best we can and then learn some skills along the way. So when you put that headset on, you actually become a female veteran. It is based on true stories, nothing we made up. It's all true stories. Uh, you become a female veteran and you just have to walk through the medical center to pick up your prescriptions and you encounter things that they've encountered along the way and also learn bystander intervention techniques. So what do you do and how do you respond? 
the number of people, we've had to up our disclaimer because you guys all know that psychological presence in an environment like that can be triggering. So we have to be very careful with how we use that experience. But the number of people who have historically maybe shrugged off a fear of harassment or an experience of harassment have actually been very, um, had very visceral reactions to the experience and changed actually how they think about and address some of our veterans who say they struggle with it. Yeah, that's really interesting. That was uh, one of the interesting takeaways from that summit for me anyway, was the training for um, not just like medical applications and therapies, but actually that access to medical care, because that's people who are denying themselves access because of this fear, right? That's right? And there was a couple other trainings that were happening in the VA too to help clinicians on the other side with their understanding and how they react to things, right? So is there like a clinician training use case that you can share with us? There are several. One I think is really interesting um, that maybe we wouldn't have thought about normally is firearm safe handling. So the number one way to prevent suicide is lethal means safety. Um, but for every reason you can imagine, we can't force our staff to handle weapons, to go through gun courses or spend time with police. We just, we can't require that. But certainly in a moment of crisis, if they're encountering a veteran, and it's happened to me in clinic before, anyone who's spent much time uh, in clinical space may encounter a veteran who's in crisis, having that um, practical knowledge on how to disarm, um, lock and store weapons, and how to talk people through that process really matters how you talk about it. And so we've been able to take the Veterans Crisis Line training that they require everybody to take in a PowerPoint. If you guys have to do PowerPoint trainings and you just right, like click the button through. Yeah, right. <laughs> so what we've done is taken that curriculum and put it into a headset so your hand controller becomes a gun, a weapon. There's six different firearms that we have in that experience now. And one of the things that people say is they felt like they learned, they felt safe. And the number of times we have people, okay, the experience is over, you can put the hand controller down. We even say hand controller. And they gently set it on the table because in their mind, they're handling a weapon. Um, and so that type of thing that is equipping our staff with some really important and practical knowledge in a really critical um, scenario. So we're excited to be able to offer that more. Yeah, that's really excellent. So what are, we've talked a little bit about some of the challenges of, about rolling these things out across the VA, right? Like, because you have regional offices everywhere, right? So how do you actually get these, like share these out to people within the VA and then also to your user community of veterans who are out there who might want to to use it, right? Yeah, that's a great question. One of the ways is you guys have helped us with this so much is it's uh, we, we try to put the stories out as much as we can. We share them, and then the more you guys share them and amplify the stories, we end up hearing that veterans are hearing about those coming back to us and asking for more access to the technology. So that really is where the broader community matters a lot. Um, it also matters that from the beginning, this has been a ground up approach where our veterans are asking for more, and so we have people who are committed uh, to trying to make that more accessible, to train our staff to make it easier. But now, really critically in the last two years, we've gotten senior executive level support like Dr. Kirsch and others who've come in and said, we need to make this normal. And so that's one of the challenges and exciting places we're in right now is if VA can make this normal across our entire healthcare system, whose board of directors is, Congress, oh. like how, like everybody can do it, right? So we're just trying to pave the way and do it together. It is going to take all of us. Um, and so we're grateful for your support, but getting, helping us get the word out and talk more about what VA is doing, I think will help us all um, do this more and do it better. Yeah. So, yeah. So I'm gonna end with that question that the last uh, panel ended with, but specific to the VA, if like we're looking down the line, but. I want to even make it more fun and futuristic. So your utopian deployment of immersive technology, what would it look like in the VA for veterans? Right? That's a great question. I love that question. Actually, when I am seeing patients in a clinic space and I recognize they need to have their blood pressure medication adjusted or need to add insulin to the regimen, I just go to a little tab where it says medications and I type it in and I order it and I don't know what happens after that except the patient gets it, right? That's what I want to see with this technology in the next five, hopefully fewer, <laughs> years, is that our clinicians don't have to think so hard about who do I reach out to, where do I go to order, how, which, is it a consult, is it a phone call, is it an email? Uh, we just want them to think the same way they think about their medications and hopefully, even where appropriate, think this first. 
uh, because we know there's a lot of opportunity to do some preventive care um, and general wellness and well-being uh, with this technology. I think it's an incredibly important feature. Yeah, that sounds right. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yep, exactly. I like it. I also like it for, for my vision is also for um, people who can't get to the centers, right? As an accessibility tool and a back and forth between the clinician. Yeah. I'd really like to see that happen. No, I, I mean, I think, you know, there's, we get the cost of, we get the cost of healthcare question a lot. Uh, but if you think about, so example, and this is not one-to-one, -one, so put that little asterisk as I tell you this, but when I was doing 100% patient care, I was managing a $17 million drug budget. That was at one medical center. The amount that we've spent on this technology over the last several years is far less than that. Now, this is not one-to-one -one with a curative antiviral versus you know, all the other things that we're seeing happen. But the reality is, one-to-one, -one, we may be seeing an incredible opportunity for cost savings. A lot of times we see technology and we immediately think that's more expensive. But is it? I mean, if we're able to augment our clinical staff, if you think about every time a clinician burns out, I think it's like, I don't even know the number. It's some huge cost, like a million. I don't know. I don't want to say that because it may not be accurate. But it's a high expense every time a single clinician burns out. Well, if we can use this technology to support that clinician, if we can use this technology to specifically help that clinician avoid burnout, well, we're saving, we're saving costs of the system not to mention quality of life, enabling people to have more care at home. I mean, the, the, the value propositions are, are just, I think, almost limitless. Um, and I think we can better articulate that as a community um, to the healthcare systems, we'll get, we'll get even more buy-in. Yeah, great. So I think we have a minute or two left, but the clock is over there, so I can't see it really. Uh, um, so we could take a question or two, see. we could take a question or two from the audience. Sure. That's a great question. Um, I normally have a, this, a question. This, oh, the, how resources. do we share resources, people are asking. <laughs> normally have some wonderful slides where you just click the QR code and I just failed to bring those, so my apologies. Innovation.va.gov, there is an immersive page um, that has our um, implementation guide, it has a link to our YouTube playlist, those kinds of things. You can also reach out to VA immersive at va.gov and that goes to our team and we'll get you anything you need. Any other questions? Yes. Hi. Um, I do have a question. We got a mic. Actually, a big theme that we've had. Oh, terrific. Yeah. A big theme that is around is the integration of AI with XR. And I'm just curious what you're seeing in the context of the VA and how that's starting to shape uh, some of the solutions that are out there. We haven't heard that at all today, have we? I, I, yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. No, I look, I get really excited about that. To be honest with you, up to this, like, last couple months, v, uh, VR specifically, we'll say immersive, and AI have been very separate um, within VA for no other reason than they just sort of grew up separately. I think one of the things we've been trying to do with immersive is, is reach across the aisle and really show that while AI is really powerful and important for every reason you know, you can demo your AI benefit in a headset. Right? And so it's an opportunity for a win-win and also to help show some reasonable and really valuable use cases that maybe don't stir as much fear or apprehension as other uses. Um, example, that prevention of sexual harassment we were talking about, those avatars' voices were created with AI. Uh, they don't live generate in the experience, but it shows you how we can do some of those things in a really powerful way. I think it's a great opportunity. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you all. I mean, XRA has a booth here, so we're come visit us at 234, and um, Anne will be around for a little bit today, but she's, she's only here for today. So That's right. Yeah. I know we're between you guys and lunch, but happy to answer questions also after if, yep. if you want to come hang out. All right. Thanks. Thank you.